guest today is Kate Romano, who is, now what exactly is your title, apart from being a miracle woman? <laughs> Thanks, Leila. I'm the CEO of this beautiful building, Stapleford Granary in South Cambridge. So the website says that the Stapleford Granary Music, art, education, and conversation in a beautiful 19th century farm complex with outstanding facilities. How did it come into being? Who owns it? Uh, how long has it been running? And how did you come to be such a support for musicians during this horrible time we've gone through? Mm -hmm. Well, the um, Stapleford Granary is owned by the Association for Cultural Exchange. Now, that's a charity that was founded in 1958. It was founded by a man called Philip Barnes, who's the father of Paul Barnes, who's the current secretary of the Association for Cultural Exchange. The Association for Cultural Exchange began as a sort of exchange program between different countries. So it was international and they were very focused originally on archaeology and architecture and they facilitated oh. adult education programs back in the 1950s and 60s a bit a bit like a sort of Erasmus exchange it grew into um, a cultural travel company Ace Cultural Tours um, which we share the site with so Stapleford Granary is the home of Ace Cultural Tours who as it says on the tin, do cultural tours around the world. But this part, um, it's all relatively new. So the granary was converted just the first phase of development took place 10 years ago. Um, and this part, uh, where close to where I am now, was only complete two years ago. So really, as an art centre, it's, it's a baby. Um, and hadn't really got time to get going before COVID hit. So... It's kind of best of times, worst of times. You know, I, I took on this job. I was offered this job in August last year, right in the middle of the pandemic, I think. Oh. At that point. Yeah, so I'm quite new to this. Um, at that point, we all still thought, oh, it'll be all right by Christmas. Yes, of course, of course. Um, so, so I've, you know, I describe it to people as a sort of dream job in the worst possible circumstances. But I have known this place for 10 years since they first started developing it because I'm a clarinetist and my ensemble had the very first artist residency here 10 years ago. So it's been a, a sort of slow and gradual development and involvement for this incredible place, which I think the original vision was that it was more of a study centre. But in more yeah. recent years, that vision has changed and the, the, now the ambition is for it to be a vibrant, bustling, relevant arts centre. So my job is to, <laughs> is to, to push forward that vision in the global pandemic, <laughs> which is quite a challenge. So does that mean then that um, you will programme it? Um, it's it's a it's a combined thing. So we do have an, an artistic director, but it's a collaborative affair. So we're looking at different ways of programming going forwards. Um, previously, the activity here was I mean they just they didn't there was it wasn't busy. So going forwards, we're just starting to look at different ways of programming in order to diversify the programming and attract a much wider audience to the granary. Because the thing is, artists love it here when they discover it. They love it and audiences love it when they discover it. But geographically, we're quite tucked away. So not many people have known about this place. So part of my job is really to, to get it on the map a lot more. Actually, you're just a hop and a skip away from Cambridge, aren't you? Yeah, we're just five miles south of Cambridge oh. Centre. So we're not yes. right in the centre, but... It, you know, unless you knew what you were looking for, you wouldn't stumble across it. It's, it's quite rural here. I mean, looking one side... Looking at one side of the site, you just see meadows and orchards, and it's very oh, beautiful. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Mm, oh, really. In terms of audiences, I mean, how many people can you hold? Well, it's quite small. Um, and again, that's been one of the challenges in the past that our concert hall, where we recorded the concerts for, for the Vancouver series, uh, the capacity is about 110, 120 at an absolute yes. So it's very small. Um, we've recently um, purchased, thanks to a fantastic donation, um, we purchased a, a large covering for the courtyard so that oh. we can do events outside. And, you know, that's, I think that's one of those examples of something that COVID was a catalyst for, but actually it's, it's kind of the right thing to do because as soon as you move outside, 
and you put it under a, a magical tent, you, you attract a completely different audience. You know, because whatever you put in a concert hall, there will be some people who never want to go to a concert hall, but they will come to an event that's outside, feels just, just something that suits them a little bit better. And, you know, you can create a really magical experience for people. So hopefully all that will help open us up to, to much wider audiences and help put us on the map a little bit more. I was going to ask you, what led you to the Stapleford grant, Granny and what's your background? So, but you did tell, you said you were a clarinetist and your group was the first. So, but it would appear to me that the work you're doing now is administrative as well as sort of artistic. And so did you have any training for what you're doing now? Yeah, I think I did. Not in a conventional way. It's funny because I, so my background, I started off as a clarinetist um, and then I started to study composition at the same time when I was an undergraduate. I went on to do a, my doctorate in composition. By the time I'd finished that, I realised I could not say what I wanted to say through writing music. And that was quite a key moment. I think realising that and being very honest about it and thinking I could be a mediocre composer, but that's not something I'm interested in. So it's always been nice to have that awareness of how music comes together. And as a performer, I've played a lot of contemporary music. And I think, you know, they're, they're, they're so linked. They're, in working with composers and talking with composers, it's one of the biggest joys of my life, that endless fascination as to why music works. And yeah, I could talk about that for ages, you know, but that that's the sort of underpins everything I think that never goes away but um, I went into academia so I spent 15 years as a head of department deputy head of department setting up a doctoral program at Guildhall Music Conservatory oh, yeah. which is you know, some, something you do when you when you love academia you love your doctorate you kind of don't want to leave it so you you drift into an academic post and inevitably I think as you become more senior in those kind of roles you end up doing, you know, more strategic stuff, more budget stuff, more finance stuff. So that was starting to happen naturally. But I think the big training, self-training, if you like, was setting up my own production company, which which was massive. I mean, to to set it up from scratch and to build it over over 10 years and to have to learn to do everything myself, whether it's getting it registered as a charity, learning how to develop business plans, learning how to fundraise on a massive scale. It, it's all been hands-on and all been self-taught, but it's happened over probably a period of 10 years. It, it all sort of comes together and then enables you to think, yeah, actually I could do a job like this because I understand all the components. This is the first time I've headed up a venue, but it all the skills are kind of there. All those transferable skills that we talk about, they are there. And yeah, I mean, some days it feels crackers. I mean, today I've spent a lot of time looking at risk assessments for the outdoors. I've been looking at flow for fire evacuations. I've been <laughs> looking at a lot of things that I think, I'm a clarinetist, what? but, <laughs> you know, yes. but at the end of the day, after we've spoken, I'm going to go home and I'll do my three hours practice because I'm recording an album next month. So it's, you know, it, it, you can do both. You can do both. It's, it's just remarkable. Fun. Can you tell me something? Can you cook as well? Oh, do you know? <laughs> I can, but it's interesting <laughs> to know that because I, I hate cooking. I re, honestly, I'd rather clean the loo than cook. I hate cooking, but I'm not bad at cooking. I'm, I'm quite good at cooking. I just hate it. And my friend Julian Phillips, a composer, he said, yes. he said, he said, of course you can cook because it's like composing. He said, you're bringing stuff together, textures and colours and flavours. He said, that's why you can do it. You might not like it, but that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I've got two children. They're 15 and 17. And there's quite a few nights where they have a ready meal because. <laughs> yes. Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you what, that's the other area of experience, isn't it? When someone says, how do you learn how to be a producer? Well, when you're juggling all these things and you're doing birthday parties for kids, and Christmas for 25 people and you just you just build up these skills don't you it's just life really it it's is like, life you know managing a production is just like being mum to a group of 40 people you've got to have the answer to everything <laughs> my back I'm not not caught in the way you are or were or reached or have reached but 
my I studied music at university and then I went into teaching and I knew nothing, you know, that was it. And then I landed up in Canada and I continued to be a music teacher. I studied the cello and the piano. And then through a burning desire, I just founded the VRS. And it was lucky that I didn't know what I was getting myself in for. Because if I had known, I would never have had the courage. I think that's a really key point, actually. And I, I've mentioned that a lot to people. Naivety can be your greatest gift, actually. That if you don't know what you're getting into, you just plow straight into it. And it's only when it's too late you realise the enormity. I think my, my story here my, uh, is you know, yeah. the first time I ever thought... Uh, I was in another ensemble, a, a mix of Western and Japanese instruments, all very interesting, where we'd been going for 10 years and we thought we needed a, a key project to mark a 10-year anniversary. And it was going to be a song cycle. Soon that escalated into the idea of a chamber opera. And there was no producer on the team and it kind of fell to me to sort of make this thing happen before I even knew that a producer was like a job. It was just the person who makes <laughs> it happen. And I thought, you know, I really was incredibly naive. I was like, well, you know, how hard can it be? We're just making an opera. Well, it's just like chamber music with singers, isn't it? You know, and, and how much can that cost? I don't know, 20 grand? And well, <laughs> you know, by the end of it, the whole thing had cost £170,000 and I'd had to raise every penny of it. And had I known what I was going into, I don't think I ever would have done. You, you know, that naivety can be, it, it starts you on your journey, doesn't it? And I think, I mean, my philosophy he has always been <clears throat> um, the most important thing is to know what you don't know and go and look for the answers. I think it's a bit like being a parent, to go back to that analogy. You actually just have to do it. We, I was on the panel once um, and there was loads of, there was all a panel of producers that Arts Council had put together and um, and they were in, in very different areas. You know, there were opera producers, there were theatre producers, there were film producers. And, and, and we were supposed to be talking about training for producers and what was needed. And we were all a bit kind of shifty and looking a bit uncomfortable with it. And then after a few minutes, somebody said, I've actually had no training whatsoever as a producer. And everyone went, neither have I, neither have I. And <laughs> literally the whole room went, well, none of us have had any training and every single person there had just worked it out as they go. And, you know, in a way, I think that's key to it because – it keeps it fresh. If, you, if you're always chasing up something new, you're always interested and, and it'll never get boring because you never quite know what you're going into. But that's, that's the totally. good thing. Totally. You know? And, you know, I think that I, again, I, I've said this before and I have become a bloody bore on it, but uh, I've been very lucky because I've never had pushback in terms of artistic choices from my board and I've never had a marketing team of course we've got somebody who works in marketing who has said you know no you can't do that because it won't sell tickets so we've had the freedom to take risks <clears throat> and I think the risk taking is what's put us where we are now because if you don't risk failure you don't risk success and and we've built an audience on trust so if I bring somebody who plays a kazoo, I can sell it out because, you know, they know it will be the best kazoo player in the world. I think that's, a, a, you know, that's the model I would like to get to here, where, I, where people trust us to know that what we programme, they will still have an interesting time. They don't have to love everything in a programme. And that's an education, isn't it? In the way that if you go to a museum, you don't expect to love every artefact, but you expect to be told stories. Exactly. You expect exactly. to have an experience and to take something away. And I think that's what we have to, to that's the kind of expectation expectation people should have of music as well I don't believe that anything is unprogrammable but you can't you know you can't just as you say chuck anything out there and expect people to come it's a gradual process of trust uh, that your audience so I think what you've done there is is fantastic and that's what I would aspire to here as we build an audience and go forwards how did so it was Alistair Tate from YCAT who came because I contacted Alistair and I said look because our focus at the Vancouver Recital Society has always been young musicians. So we decided that if we were going to do any streaming of musicians, I wanted it to be musicians 
young up and coming musicians who people don't know like the back of their hand here. Because remember, we're 4,700 odd miles away from you. So that's why I went to Alistair, because I love what they do. And it was he who said, oh, look, there's this wonderful venue in Cambridge. So how did he find you? When I started here last August, there was already a sort of email trail there. So Sue from YCAT, there was an email basically for someone to respond so I said hey look this is brilliant why cat have contacted us so I'm not actually sure how that particular link was made but I, I what I will say is that during the lockdown a lot of arts centers and venues closed completely because they just had to now we managed to stay open for filming and streaming there's a there was an exemption not not the whole time but there was an exemption that uh, under work you cannot do from home and because of the nature of the site because as you can see we're so open plan we're a contemporary build we've got fantastic air extraction it's all open it's actually a very safe environment even in covid so we could manage these small numbers in our concert hall and actually do it completely safely. So I think we, one of the first things I did when I got here was black out the concert hall and invest in some decent lighting um, so we could do streaming because it wasn't set up for that. And thank God we did that. Uh, Because honestly, it was, it was one of the most joyful things to be able to do the YCAT concerts and then others came off the back of that. Yes, of course. Um, Joyful for them, joyful for us. I think everyone's just, well, you can see it in the films, can't you? The the joy in playing again and going, I, I kind of forgotten who I was and now I remember. I'm yes. a music and I can do this thing. It's so important. It kept people going, I think, what, what you were offering and what we were able to do, you know, as a collaboration. I think it really kept musicians going. It's so important. And my philosophy also is you never know. And one of the joys of this is, you know, I mean, I put in the e-newsletter, we are deeply grateful to the Stapleford Granary for blah, blah, blah. Well, what the hell is the, you know, it's a building, but it's the people in the building that make the things happen. And so I just, I was so curious to know much more about you. And this, this conversation is a revelation to me. So I just, oh, it's just one, I mean, I'm sure you talked to lots of fascinating, I know you talked to lots of fascinating people. (laughs) Sure I do, but your range of interests and your accomplishments are so broad that I can talk to you in and around subjects and you can see through them and under them and over them. I mean, it's remarkable. And I think think every music student should have a, a session with you. (laughs) Um. (laughs) well I love talking to students I I love I love that you know that generation and I think they have been so because they're remarkable people they're at that fantastic fascinating transition between leaving from full-time education and higher education and going to the into the workforce and it's so difficult and it's even more difficult now you know with with covid and with brexit and all the rest of it and yet they remain so resilient and entrepreneurial and their, their spirit is incredible and i so one thing i thought i would miss the most about leaving guildhall leaving academia but fortunately i've still kept some links and I, I do mentoring and modules with postgrads who are, you know, as I said earlier, setting up their own organisations. And they never fail to inspire you, I think, young musicians, they, with their, their passion, their relentless passion. And, you know, they'll, they'll find a way. They'll find a way to be creative because it's in them. Exactly. And I mean, you know, and I don't think any of them is naive to, enough to think that uh, they're going to go into this and make a fortune. But strangely... Not realistic, but I don't think it's dampened their ambition in different ways. I think it's well, bringing out creativity in different ways. They know yeah. that they're not going to perhaps walk into an orchestral job. So they're looking at what they've got and thinking, what else can I do with this? And, and you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things about the pandemic is that I think it shifted the hierarchies a bit. So all those kind of, you know, the superstars, suddenly we didn't hear from them for a while, but actually there were a load of really creative musicians who said, I've got good technical skills, but what I'm doing? And, you know, those slightly lesser known voices really started to come through. And I liked that. 
I thought it showed, it, it, you know, it showed a different side of what classical music could be. And often the skills that were valued less perhaps started to be valued more. And I thought that was really important. I hope we don't lose that. There, there are so many things that as we've sat back and had time to think and analyse uh, that we will come out the other end. I mean, you know, I think there's still some question. I know that I've had emails from supporters who say, when are the tickets going on sale? We're rushed back. But, you know, there are people who say, well, no, that, you know, we'll still be nervous. So none of us, I don't think, here anyway in Vancouver, because we're being very cautious and nothing has opened up, just restaurants last week, um, how people will feel and how things will go forward. For sure, nothing is going to be the same. I mean, I think transitioning out of this, if that what we're doing is is the hardest part for sure i mean you know when when we all when we all couldn't do anything that was tough but this, this is different tough it's like you know one of my phrases is it, it's 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 you know it's it's like planning on quicksand it's knitting with fog whatever you want to call it yes it's just, yes it, it can shift three times within one day and i think all of us you know anyone who heads up a festival or a venue or a concert series we've all gone round and round in circles revising budgets again and again and again and you know you spend more time doing that than you do spend anything else this kind of slightly pointless futile activity of just going round and round in circles, but you yeah. have to do one thing that I have noticed is I think a new level of understanding between artists and venues and festivals that they understand that we cannot commit to things because it's out of our hands they do get that um and we try and be as fair and upfront as possible i know some venues who have for example issued two contracts they've said this is your fee if we're socially distanced this is your fee if we're not socially distanced are, are you willing to accept that? Which to me seems a pretty fair way of doing it. And an, absolutely, an artist, if they say yes or no, but at least you're being transparent. You and they understand a little bit more about how venues work and how you know. And I don't think that's a bad thing. So I think there's been some quite healthy sort of conversations about how things really work, which hopefully everyone's benefited from. And I, and I think that collaborative approach is absolutely essential. The minute somebody starts making demands it's just impossible unfortunately they haven't but that brings another very important element i think in what we do and that is to a large extent it's about relationships and when you've worked with managers for years and you have a relationship you know they know i'm not going to walk away and screw them or vice versa we're all reasonable with one another i'm so fascinated to hear you talk about the, you know, this capacity or that capacity. We're not at that point yet, but I mean, I've been uh, thinking that uh, if we had only 20% capacity in our hall, uh, it would be financial suicide for us. So one of the things, of course, we were looking into and are still looking into because we still don't know what's gonna happen is if when we start up again, we should do a film concert as it's live stream the concert and then go away. So all the performances that we've had live streamed to date, we haven't charged for. They've been uh, gifts to our supporters. Um, but I think if, if there are people coming into the hall who are willing to pay for the 20% of the seats, it's then I think people who, sit at home and watch and pay as well. It's very interesting, isn't it? I think this has been one of the massive learning curves in COVID that, you know, when we all thought in classical music, we thought, aha, okay, this has happened. Right, let's go online. The first bit, I think, was organisations really realising that they've been a bit, in this country, many realising they've been a bit lazy with the whole digital thing and not really knowing how to just go online. You know, they weren't set up for it. They hadn't, well, there was a lot of inexperience about filming and cameras and, and it's been a hugely steep learning curve uh, for so many organisations. And then the other massive issue is how to monetize it. And there's been so many models going on. There's been subscription series, there's been donations, there's been pay what you want, pay what you can, ticket prices. 
I don't think, I've been watching it like a hawk, but I don't think there's any kind of foolproof. There isn't one that's emerged as this is the way forward. Um, no. I think some who started off with donations, the donations were small to begin with and then have escalated. Others have seen patterns of ticket, you know, energy for tickets and then drop off. And I personally started spending more on online tickets as the pandemic went on. Um, I don't know whether that's typical or not, but... It's been very hard to that. I mean, that just a massive learning curve for everybody um, to do that. One thing what we're doing here is that uh, we're, we're opening up in July for six indoor events and one outdoor. Um, so if if we've still got COVID, well, we assumed we would still have some restrictions in place. So we've sold the concerts or are selling them on the understanding that they will be socially distanced. We've promised that to our audiences so that they feel safe. Even if the even if our government says you can come back, I think people need that confidence because they say, yes. I don't feel ready. You know, I've been locked at home for a year and a half. I don't feel ready to sit next to someone in a concert hall. Now, our concert hall is tiny anyway. So, you know, to sell that, to, to go socially distanced in our concert hall, we're down to about 35 seats instead of about 110. Obviously, we, we can't operate at that. So we've made concerts shorter, 60 minutes, no interval, no programme, no. Okay. Yeah. And artists, artists are playing twice. So we do a six o'clock concert and we do an eight o'clock concert. We sell each one, 35 tickets. We're up to 70 tickets and it just about starts to wash its face. So that, and again, we, we tell, you know, we've been really upfront with artists and say, this is the only way we can make it work. It's a shorter programme. Are you interested in performing twice? And and that that's what we can offer at the moment. Going forwards into the autumn, hopefully things will be a little bit more normal by then. Um, as you said earlier, we, we're ditching paper programmes forever. I've I think conversation is so important to me. I like pre-concert talks. I like chatting to the artists. I think audiences do. So we're having lots more chat, lots more opportunities to engage with the artists and our concerts will be short as well going forwards no more than 70 minutes and no interval so that we're sort of giving people more choice as to how they spend their time with us so they could come for a pre-concert talk and a drink and a concert or they could come to the concert and then stay and meet the artists afterwards but it's just you know up more opportunities for audiences to choose how they spend their time with us and far more opportunities to talk and have conversations. Well, I hope that th this conversation today is, is just the beginning of many more engagements with you, Kate. Well, it's an absolute joy to meet, meet you. Everyone's been talking about you as they came to do the, the, the concerts oh, here. And so it's really nice to get you. the driving force behind it all. Thank you for making it happen um, for us, but also for the musicians as well, because it was it was such a joy during the bleakest time yes. of the lockdown. Yeah. I can't tell you how much it meant to all of us. Um, so Great. it's just a fantastic Congrats. relationship. Wonderful Great. To you. This Great. is the beginning. Let's build on it going forward. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Thank you so Thanks much so for much. everything from the bottom Pleasure. of our hearts. Okay. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Take Bye -bye. care.